The third approach to international relations is constructivism. It also subsumes critical theory, also called postmodernism, and in the reading I assigned you as feminism. Constructivism is essentially a framework that argues that ideas matter and have an independent effect. It therefore encompasses idealism. The constructivist framework challenges realism on the grounds that realism cannot explain how change occurs or how identities are formed. Realism assumes that the world will always be the same in the essence of its structure. You will have a system of political organizations, whether they're states, empires, city-states, leagues, and that these units compete against each other. However, realism cannot explain why it changes from one set of units to another. How can realism explain the change from Greek city-states to the Roman Empire, then to the feudal system in Europe, and then to the modern state system in, uh, and to the European Union? The simple realist explanation is that the strongest unit survives, but it doesn't explain what is their criteria for the success at any one point in time. Also, it doesn't address identity. How do people group themselves? Well, most often they group themselves according to where they were born, but also how they were raised. So again, the simple realist answer is that identity is a matter of selection. The strongest identities survive, but again, it doesn't provide the criteria for success. In the realm of ideas, probably the most competitive forum is the form of religion, especially in regions like South Asia, where you have almost every single global religion represented. The competition is intense, and the mutual influence between the religions uh, should not be underestimated. So religion is often a very good test of which idea is best adapted to people in a particular circumstance, particularly when they change their religion. Buddhism, which is essentially a philosophic offshoot of Hinduism, was adopted as uh, the most common religion in China. Now, constructivism has a number of assumptions. First, Ideas matter, and they have an independent effect upon human behavior and organization. For example, we often think that dueling or slavery went out of style because they were economically inefficient. This is the argument made by Marxists. But since dueling was never efficient, organizationally speaking, and slavery was not in economic decline in the Southeast US in the middle of the 19th century, we can see that what happened is the impact of ideas on practices. And these practices were viewed as obsolete and undesirable. You can see on the right, Pushkin, one of Russia's most famous poets, who survived 21, but not 22, duels. Ideas also affect what people want and how they want to go about getting them. So it's an effect on preferences and strategies. Now, constructivism has three problems. First, constructivism is a young approach, and it lacks a coherent and reproducible theory of learning and how ideas are transmitted. Number two, constructivism has no theory of selection, why certain ideas flourish and others die out. And third, it's very difficult to measure the impact of ideas. One application of constructivism is in the norms that states create intersubjectively, meaning they create it between states, and then they follow that order in practice. Alexander Wendt argued that anarchy in the international system is more than just the absence of overarching authority which was argued by Kenneth Waltz and the neorealists. Wendt argues that anarchy is what states socially make of it. 
Because even in an apparent anarchical situation where you have no overarching authority, types of ordered interaction emerge that cause you to ask the question, what brought about that order? And so there is many different patterns of behavior in different anarchical settings where you have no overarching authority. Now this is a heavily debated uh, uh, proposition. Generally, re uh, realists reject that anarchy can be anything at all. But there is the puzzle, again, of the Silk Route, where you had a lot of ordered behavior, and clearly no single state was in charge. So let's take a look now at the work of James Lee Ray. He made a study of the impact of ideas in politics and history. His goal was to examine whether the incidence of war can be eliminated by delegitimizing the idea of war. And he did this by comparing it with the process of delegitimization of slavery and colonialism, which ended those practices. So let's start with slavery. Slavery declined and disappeared as a practice because it came to be viewed as immoral and therefore illegitimate. And this is a hypothesis that James Lee Ray will test. You can see here on the eve of the American Civil War the distribution of the slave population, which is in the southeast part of the U.S., as well as the freed African American population that lives to the north. And uh, this was the population distribution at the time of America's fight over the legitimacy of slavery. So the competing or alternative explanation, which comes from the Marxists and economic sociological arguments, is that slavery was replaced because it was less efficient than mechanization. And the Industrial Revolution and those that were participating in the Industrial Revolution in the northeastern part of the United States were therefore opposed to the use of slaves because they would have preferred to use machines to do all the work. Marxists generally view history as a class struggle that translates through successive historical stages of economic production, what they call the modes of production. So you have a move from slavery in Europe to uh, feudalism to capitalism. So this is called economic materialism because the material basis for the economy drives the organization of society. In each successive stage of economic development, uh, you have a more uh, uh, a level of efficiency brought by the mode of production. Now, historically, slavery was a ubiquitous practice. It was widely accepted. Uh, it was certainly theorized by Aristotle. There were occasional slave revolts, uh, the most famous of which in Rome was, of course, Spartacus. There were significant slave revolts as well in the Caribbean and some revolts in the southeastern U.S. There was a very large revolt in Haiti, which established the independence uh, of that country. However, almost no people in history have not had slavery until the last two centuries. It persists in select parts of Africa, such as Mauritania in India, and allegedly it existed in Tibet uh, when the Chinese army entered at the end of the Chinese Civil War. So the constructivist explanation is that ideas matter and can exist independently of the underlying material conditions within which people live. So ideas can also have a greater impact than underlying material conditions in affecting behavior, given the right circumstances. Here you can see an anti-slavery debate in the British Parliament in 1840. While the English had banned slavery and put increasing restrictions on slavery before that within the British Empire, and even had a policy of intercepting other slave ships that were bringing slaves from Africa, particularly to Brazil, the British did not interfere with slave ships going to the United States. So uh, great power politics continued to govern limits. The British didn't want to get into a large war with the US uh, in the early 19th century over uh, slavery. 
Slavery in Christian Europe declined because of its prohibition under the laws of the church. The Marxists would have predicted that the rise of feudalism made it so that there was no longer an economic need for slaves. Now this did not affect the slave trade which continued in the Mediterranean. Eventually, when Albuquerque entered the Indian Ocean, the Europeans took over the slave trade, particularly from the Sultanate of Oman uh, around AD 1500 when they seized Zanzibar. And this then uh, allowed the Europeans to use slaves for plantations off the west coast of Africa and then to transplant slaves to the Caribbean for plantation economies and for mining in South America. Now Quakers and other religious Puritan groups in Great Britain largely organized the new policy prohibiting the slave trade for explicitly religious reasons. Great Britain prohibited the slave trade in 1807. It ended slavery in its own territories by 1833 and engaged in a policy inhibiting other states from doing the same by means of its dominant navy. The US ended slavery in 1865, Cuba ended slavery in 1886, and Brazil followed in 1888. The prevailing economic evidence indicates that slavery was doing well. In other words, it was a productive source of labor in the British Empire and its prohibition resulted in a 30 to 50 percent loss of production and loss of market share to Brazil and Cuba that continued to use slaves. Similarly, slavery was, was both important and an effective mode of production in the United States as a whole. In the South, where plantations were located, and the North, where raw materials were processed. So the evaluation is that where the economic materialist argument demonstrated, then ideas would follow the prevailing mode of production. But in the case of slavery, the ideational direction was in the opposite direction to that of the logic of economic efficiency. More importantly, it prevailed over economic efficiency, which is surprising. We can apply the same model to colonialism. Now there's been a, a gradual delegitimization of colonialism. It still happens in the sense of denying local autonomy in uh, uh, Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara, Chinese occupation of Tibet, um, First Nations reservations in Canada, <clears throat> certain autonomous republics in Russia, uh, Danish um, control of Greenland, um, the occupied territories in Israel, the West Bank and Gaza, uh, there, virtually every country in the world has a community that would be separatist uh, given the proper circumstances that could be classified as being controlled, subjugated, uh, or colonized. Now international norms are strongly against the permanent occupation of foreign societies. So can we apply this to the logic of war? Well, ending war. As it stands now, although starting wars is coming to be seen as illegitimate, fighting wars in and of itself is not. For war to become obsolete, there must be an ethical standard against the initiation of war. So even if conquest was illegitimate, preemptive war may nonetheless occur for defensive reasons. World War I and the impact it had on a literate working population who then produced masses of memoirs and poetry, largely ended war as a adventure for young men. And so that really is the beginning of the date of the delegitimization of war in the Western world. Now there are some similarities with slavery and war, and that is there's the us versus them distinction, and of course there's the use of force. But there's also a difference with slavery. The consequence of abolishing slavery when others don't is less significant than re renouncing the resort to arms when others still resort to war. So war is not delegitimized because of the danger of vulnerability. So there's still a significant amount of legitimacy in a country protecting itself. Norms. An aspect of constructivism is the role of ideas in the form of norms of behavior. Norms are expectations of behavior. For a norm to persist, it must be reproduced through some sort of teaching, although it may evolve over time and across geography. Rarely is a norm universally accepted within a population, and there are often 
sizable exceptions. An important aspect of studying norms is their accurate measurement. A common problem in the study of norms is claiming the existence of a norm without having an actual appreciation for its actual depth or breadth. For example, there was a strong pacifist movement in the 1930s across Western Europe and North America, and there was a general reluctance to build up militarily. In a book written by Leon Blum, the French Socialist Party leader and later French Premier in the 1936, he says, quote, if a nation thus undertook to disarm, it would not in reality incur any risk because the moral prestige which it would require would render it invulnerable to attack and the force of its example would induce all other states to follow. Now, Bloom did not appreciate that the pacifist norm did not extend to the fascist states within Europe and within four years, uh, France had been conquered. Postmodernism. This is less of a reaction to realism per se than to the scientific method itself. If you recall the first lecture we looked at with independent dependent variables. Postmodernism has a different conception of reality. It is principally concerned with explaining why certain groups, women, minorities, and the developing world are socioeconomically disadvantaged. So its normative goal is to address the disenfranchisement and to fix the problem. So it's looking for action. Postmodernism has five interlinked assumptions. First, reality is defined by the structure of language. This is called discourse. Two, determining a perspective within reality depends on the reference point of the viewer. Number three, Reality is therefore relative. There is no objective, subjective, or empirical normative distinction. Number four, the structure of language also represents power relations, sometimes called domination. By speaking a certain language, you unconsciously accept the reality of the power relations and the domination. Number five, by deconstructing language or narrative, Critical theorists attempt to emancipate people trapped by language relations. So what are the problems with postmodernism? Well, first, the main problem with critical theory and postmodernism is that it lacks a reproducible epistemology. Because it is relativistic and based on reference points, there is no reproducible way of determining whether any of its findings are in fact true its truth value is entirely dependent on individual reaction. Number two, as with constructivism, it is extremely difficult to test. There's no consistent method of deconstructing a language to uncover the underlying power structures that create domination. Now, one type of feminism is feminist postmodernism. Feminist postmodernism or critical theory has a number of assumptions. One, the structure of language domination has led to two sets of ideas. The feminine set of ideas, which emphasizes nurturing and cooperation, and the masculine set of ideals, which focuses on domination. So let's take a look at the masculine ideals. The masculine ideals, A, distinguish between self and nature into subject and object, which facilitates domination. B, it places objectivity over subjectivity. C, it places the empirical over the normative. D, it places the abstract over the narrative. E, it places logic over reason. F, it places the individual over the community. Two, there are no biological causes of behavioral differences between men and women. Of course, not all feminists believe this, but this is the core of the critical uh, theory feminists. Differences of behavior are the result of socialization of ideas, feminine ideas for women and masculine ideas for men. Three, 
The international state of affairs is largely a product of the domination created by the masculine ideal. Therefore, if the masculine ideal is replaced by the feminine ideal, we would have a world run more peacefully. Number four, feminine ideals are desirable because they are life-giving and male ideas are undesirable because they're dominating. Now let's take a look at J. Ann Tickner's assessment. She applies the logic of feminist critical theory to Morgenthau's Six Principles of Political Realism and suggests a feminist reconception. So here are her six critiques. One, objectivity is masculine, so dynamic objectivity is better. This is where dynamic objectivity acknowledges the independent integrity of the outside world and our connection with it. Two, the national interest is not simply about power, but is multidimensional and interdependent. Number three, power is not a universal concept. She implies it's a masculine idea. It misses collective empowerment, which is feminine. Number four, the normative and the empirical are inseparable. Number five, moral aspirations of nations cannot be reconciled with universal moral principles, but there are common moral elements. Number six, denies the autonomy of the political.